Today, we're diving deep into a topic that has sparked controversy and outrage for years, race hoaxes. We'll be discussing a blog post that sheds light on some high-profile cases, exposing the truth behind these incidents. But before we start, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the incredible work done by the blogger Heels in the Air for her dedication in uncovering these stories. It takes courage and persistence to bring these issues to the forefront, and her efforts have not gone unnoticed. In this eye-opening blog post from September 2, 2014, titled Race Hustle, you can only cry, victim, so many times before you're a willing participant, we are confronted with a disturbing reality. The post highlights the unfortunate truth that some racially charged incidents, in their entirety, turn out to be hoaxes. One of the most notable cases mentioned is the Megan Williams gang rape hoax in 2007, a story that ignited nationwide outrage. We begin, however, with a story that's received less media attention than the noose incidents. This September, a 20-year-old African-American woman in West Virginia was kidnapped, raped, tortured, held captive for over a week by six white men and women. I'm talking about Megan Williams. This is an excerpt of how she described her ordeal to the Associated Press in October. They all passed the knife around and, it was, and stabbing me. Um, I was trying to get away as they were stabbing me and they were holding me down and stuff. And they smothered me with a um, bag. Um, that morning I had a bag right around my neck and everything. They choked me. They made me eat dog poop, rat poop, and human. They made me drink their urine. And each time um, they braided some switches together and they beat me across the back. They tore my clothes off me and everything. And then they took me up to a lake. They said that was um, the place they're going to cut my throat and throw me in. I was never going to come back to my family again. They were just telling me that they were going to kill me. And, you know, I was, um, they made me take a bath in a trash can. They wouldn't let me use the bathroom. I had to use the bathroom outside. I had to sleep outside. And they told me if they even remotely heard me once that they were going to go out there and kill me. And they poured candle wax in my hair. They pulled my hair out when they were cutting it with scissors. And, you know, um, they are just scary. They had me tied up. I couldn't go anywhere. Um, like the time when they left, they were going to go get some beer and stuff. And when they came back, they said they're going to finish me off. And before they even got back, I had already got loose. I found a knife and cut myself loose. Um, I heard the police coming up to the driveway. When I seen the police, I just, you know, I knew it was, you know, my chance to get out. You know, if I didn't, I was going to die anyway. And then that's when they see me coming out there and they thought, um, they said I could. Lo I was going to lose my leg when they see my, my stats, and I was scared. I didn't know what to do. Megan Williams' case, where she claimed to be a victim of a heinous crime, turned out to be a hoax orchestrated by individuals with a political agenda. It's cases like these that raise important questions about the credibility of such incidents and the people involved. The blog post also delves into other well-known cases like the Tawana Brawley and Duke Lacrosse rape hoaxes, all of which share common denominators such as influential figures like Al Sharpton, Malik Shabazz, and attorney Benjamin Crump, along with a clear political agenda. Williams. Malik Shabazz is Megan Williams' lawyer. She's, he is also co-founder of Black Lawyers for Justice, the leader of the new Black Panther Party, helped organize the Hate Crime Awareness March in Charleston on November 3rd. Malik Shabazz joins us from Washington, D.C. Welcome to Democracy Now! Can you tell us about the latest in the case of Megan Williams? Yes, the latest uh, for, in our efforts to secure justice for Megan Williams means that we're following up on our march. We don't just have marches for symbolic reasons. We were able to raise $5,000 in our goal of raising $20,000 to help comfort her in this hour. We're continuing to fight for hate crime charges to be established in this case on a state and a federal level. There is some movement. Uh, we're continuing to provide legal assistance for her in other areas at this hour. 
Uh, we're also working uh, with other groups in the community, working with groups such as Sisters of Color Ending Sexual Assault to provide really what Megan needs right now, and that's wraparound help, wraparound services to help her to get better. And so we're fighting on various fronts to keep following up and fighting to raise the, 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 the voice and the issue of this case, which is being swept under the rug. These individuals, who often advocate for the victims, sometimes end up being part of a larger scheme, questioning the authenticity of the incidents they support. It's crucial to examine these cases critically and seek the truth beyond the headlines. Been filed in the Megan Williams case. He claims he tried, but he was being rebuffed by the Bush-led uh, U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. I can believe him on that point. Uh, United States Department of Justice, uh, we commonly refer to it as the United States Department of Injustice. It vigorous, vigorously uh, uh, attacks the civil liberties, civil rights, the human rights of those that they suspect of so-called terrorism. It, it advocates the wiretapping uh, of private citizens, the intrusion of bank accounts. It advocates to, uh, the violating the rights of prisoners abroad and at home under the guise of fighting terrorism. But when terrorism comes against our people here and is continuously occurring, as in the case of Megan Williams and other cases, the United States Department of Justice Civil Rights Division has its hands tied, they won't do anything, and they simply don't care. As we so, navigate yeah. through these intricate stories, it's important to recognize the dedication of bloggers like Heels in the Air, who tirelessly research and bring these facts to light. Their work challenges our perceptions and encourages us to question the narratives we're presented with. Almost every high-profile, racially inflamed case has its share of hoaxes, sometimes the case, in its entirety, is a hoax. The most recognized of those being the Tawana Brawley and Duke Lacrosse rape hoaxes. These two cases have been written about and hashed over ad nauseum, so I won't rehash them here except to point out case players. I do want to point out, however, many of the which turn out to be a full-blown, or partial hoax, have a few common denominators, Al Sharpton, Malik Shabazz, and in recent years, attorney Benjamin Crump. Another common denominator is a political agenda. 20-year-old Megan Williams ignited a nationwide outrage in 2007 when she said she was gang-raped in Charleston, W., Virginia. Williams, 22, told cops in 2007 she escaped from a ramshackle trailer near Charleston, W.V., where she was held captive for a week, and where she was raped, tortured, and forced to eat her own feces. Seven suspects pleaded guilty, and all but one are now serving long jail terms. In a statement, Sharpton said he visited Williams after her horrific story broke and gave her some of his personal money, after her supporters told him she had no resources for Christmas. Malik Shabazz was both the attorney for Megan Williams and her mother. More than $70,000 was raised from the gullible African-American community when this story broke. Megan claimed she never saw any of that money. Megan's mother, who was acting on Megan's behalf, encouraged Megan to lie about her story. Williams' recantation of Lawyer Potts says that she was coerced by her late mother and the notorious leader of the new Black Panther Party, Malik Shabazz. Williams' mother had been feuding with the families of the defendants and wanted revenge. Williams wanted revenge against her abusive boyfriend who dumped her, Bobby Brewster. Her mother is dead now, so who knows where the money went, my guess is she and Shabazz split it. What sort of mother tells her daughter to lie and railroad six men? We see them all the time folks, not so much encouraging their children to lie, but lying for their children posthumously. Sharpton said that when Williams' lawyer notified him that she was changing her story, he immediately wrote to West Virginia prosecutors, asking them to vindicate any wrongfully convicted individuals. Rich, isn't it? Sharpton has never asked that his innocent victims be vindicated. In fact, he has never even apologized to his victims in the Tawana Brawley case. Elements common to every race hoax were front and center in this one as well. Election for state attorney was quickly approaching, the state attorney general, McGraw, has made it clear that he doesn't think Logan County Prosecutor Brian Abraham can handle the racially explosive case. The alleged victim and her mother met with Congresswoman Shalia Jackson Lee, Democrat Texas, and members of the Congressional Black Caucus December 12 in Washington, D.C., to share Megan Williams' story, gain support, and push for strengthening of federal hate crime laws. Malik Zulu Shabazz and Reverend Al Sharpton, of the National Action Network, 
hold a December 18th rally and fundraiser for Ms. Williams in Charleston, West Virginia, to garner more support for her cause. The family of Megan Williams became upset with prosecutor Abraham because he attempted to have the court appoint a legal guardian for 20-year-old Williams, saying that the people around her did not have her best interests at heart by allowing her to give media interviews and take part in rallies. Mr. Shabazz blasted the prosecutor for the move, saying Megan was legally an adult, had two parents and two attorneys to guide and advise her effectively without the court's help. Al Sharpton says this case should be front and center in America, presidential candidates should be discussing it. Interviews on liberal programs to promote the hate, Democracy Now!, and their interview with Malik Shabazz, video features Megan Williams talking about her ordeal. A very disturbing comment on this video illustrates the hate and violence these race hoaxes perpetrate. Black Tut If was to see a white cracker raping a white three-month-old cracker baby, like they always do, I would clap and walk away. Actually I would pay the cracker $100 to keep up the good work, I would love to enjoy the sounds of its cries. Just like you all like to enjoy the death of innocent animals and black. I just want to blast a 40 for Magnum through one of you little white demons' head, and watch your head spill to the ground. West Virginia State University used Megan Williams' story to call for hate crime law changes. They say the statute is too weak. In October 2009, Williams recanted her accusations against five of the defendants, but still accuses her former boyfriend, Bobby Ray Brewster, of abuse. Duke Lacrosse, prosecutor Mike Nifong, was re-elected during the investigation of this case, he was subsequently disbarred after it was determined Nifong withheld evidence that would have cleared the accused. On May 1, 2006, Malik Shabazz, along with an estimated 30 members of the new Black Panther Party, led a march around the Duke University campus. The march was in support of Crystal Gale Magnum, a stripper who alleged she was kidnapped and raped by members of the men's lacrosse team, on March 13, 2006. Colin Finnerty and Reed Seligman were indicted by a grand jury on charges of first-degree forcible rape, first-degree sexual offense and kidnapping. David Evans was indicted two weeks later. According to several books written about the case, Shabazz had access to state attorney Nifong's evidence. His evidence showed there was no DNA to tie these students to an alleged rape. Shabazz led marchers through Durham yelling, how do you find the two defendants in this case, and the marchers replied, guilty. Shabazz and NBPP demanded that Finnerty and Seligman be sent to prison, and that all those who attended the party at 610 North Buchanan be expelled from school. The marchers were headed toward the house where the alleged rape took place, 610 North Buchanan. One of the marchers, Victoria Peterson, urged the crowd to burn down the house. Once the marchers arrived at the house, Malik Shabazz yelled out to them, You are the shame of the planet Earth today. You are ashamed to yourselves and you are ashamed to the university. Other cases involving Malik Shabazz slash Al Sharpton and Benjamin Crump. Michael Brown case in Ferguson, Missouri, Michael Brown's parents are being represented by Benjamin Crump. Al Sharpton and Malik Shabazz have appeared with Crump to demand Officer Darren Wilson be charged with murder. Crump is being assisted in this case by Andrew Marcel, Malik Shabazz, Al Sharpton, Eric Hodder, Obama, media, low information public. Kendrick Johnson case in Valdosta, Georgia, Johnson's parents were slash are represented by Benjamin Crump and Shaveen King. Al Sharpton and Malik Shabazz have appeared with Crump to demand an arrest in the accidental death of Kendrick Johnson. This case is currently under review by U.S. Attorney Michael Moore, Georgia. Trayvon Martin case in Sanford, Florida, Martin's parents were slash are represented by Benjamin Crump and Daryl Parks. George Zimmerman was eventually acquitted, the jury found he had acted in self-defense. To this day Crump still parades the parents around to stump for his later cases, and the family is still raking in donations. Crump was assisted in this case by Andrew Marcel, Malik Shabazz, Al Sharpton, Eric Hodder, Congress, Obama, Low Information Public. Martin Lee Anderson Anderson's parents were represented by Benjamin Crump. Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson led rallies and marches. The defendants were acquitted, likely due to the mother of Anderson neglecting to write on his application for boot camp that he had sickle cell anemia. Crump won a $5 million civil lawsuit, with the aid of Pam Bondi and Charlie Crist. An excellent breakdown of the players in this case can be found here. Senator Barack Obama, Al Sharpton, and Jesse Jackson were scheduled to attend a rally for Anderson, only Jackson and Al Sharpton appeared. Jeannie McMean's officer Cresshon Walker Virgins shot and killed McMean's when he disobeyed an order to lie on the ground, instead he allegedly got up and charged the officer. Although unarmed, she thought he was going for a gun. A grand jury refused to indict the Virgins. A few months later FHP Colonel Chris Knight penned a letter to the officer to let her know she would be fired. She quit instead. Fast forward to a few years later, 
Knight resigned his position after accusations of discrimination and falsifying documents. Governor Charlie Crist weighed in. I think that Bussell has acted with good judgment, and I think the former head of the state troopers did the right thing by resigning, he said. Benjamin Crump was the attorney for the McMeans family. These cases of the Jenna Six, Megan Williams, Martin Lee Anderson, Sean Bell, and General Wilson, they are just a smidgen of what is going on throughout America by evil white people bent on teaching us a lesson. Minister Louis Farrakhan There are so many other figures, public and otherwise, tied to these cases and so little time, but to give you an idea of how embedded the players in these shady cases and in hate ignited cases are, consider another example of this tangled web. Russell Simmons and Benjamin Chavis, business partners and hip-hop moguls and endeared by the black community as leaders. Benjamin Chavis is a supporter of Asada Shakur, who was convicted of killing New Jersey State Trooper Werner Forster and grievously assaulting State Trooper James Harper in 1979. She escaped from prison and has been living in Cuba since. Simmons has been a vocal supporter of Benjamin Crump's cases, especially the Trayvon Martin case. Benjamin Chavis, also of Wilmington 10 fame, was involved behind the scenes. Where else can we find the kind of in-depth reporting that Heels in the Air offers in her blog? To all those YouTubers who unjustly labeled Heels in the Air as racist for her blog, it's time for a reality check. You're the ones perpetuating race-based sensationalism, and you should be ashamed of yourselves. This message is directed at White Boy Lockdown Radio, The Glare, Crimes and Fashion, The Good Nunya, Burnt Toast, Down the Rabbit Hole News, Dolly Vision, JLR, Scientific Skeptic, and anyone else I might have missed. To those YouTubers who have featured Heels in the Air's clips on your live streams and had her on your panels, yet failed to even read her blog or speak up on her behalf, your actions are disappointing and, frankly, pathetic. This message is for Queen Bee, Bee Tim, and anyone else who might be trying to cozy up to her again. I want to make it clear that I don't hold you in high regard, and any niceties I extend your way are solely out of respect for her channel when I visit. Shout out to BXB's boy, Audacity, and everyone else who spoke out against the woke bullshit. You have my respect. Check the links in the description, hit the like button if you liked this, and I'll catch you all in the chat rooms.